can access the event page, but it only gives her the option to join as a viewer. Okay, I'll let me figure that out. Okay, let's, I mean, see if there are viewers. Let's, let me post on the... Well, oh, we have, okay, we have one viewer. That's exciting. Um, <laughs> okay, so I guess as, as she figures out where, how to move forward, um, we'll at least start with, yeah, um, to introduce yourselves, um, you know, I'm Natalie, the student president of NASM, and hopefully this will be useful to our viewers that those of you who are interested in a life in academia, we have some amazing professors who are in the middle of that process in various stages and hopefully answer some questions. And it, okay, it sounded, I think it, I, it, I hoped it sounded like Andrew was joining us, um, but so introduce yourselves, and then and then we'll kind of jump in and get started. Go ahead, Melissa. Okay. So I'm Melissa Davies. I am in my uh, second year out of my PhD. Oh, there she is. Um, <laughs> I figured right. it out. Okay. Welcome. Thank you. Okay. So Tell we're just doing, we're just doing introductions. So you didn't miss anything yet. Okay. Okay, so I'm Melissa Davies. I am at University of the Pacific. I am in, um, like I said, my second year, but this is my first year along a tenure track line. So I'm very fresh in the experience um, in terms of what you're probably going through soon if you're any PhD students. Um, and I know all of these people because I serve on the um, Publicity and Promotions Committee with NASM. So um, is, that, is there anything else you wanted shared with that? No, that's great. Um, yeah. Do you guys want to continue? Sure. I'm Brianna Newland. I'm at the University of Delaware. I'm a little bit farther along than Melissa. Um, <laughs> I was actually just telling Natalie that I'm putting going to be putting in my dossier for tenure next year. So um, we'll see how that goes. Okay. <laughs> next. Um, I'm Andrea Guerin, and I'm a little bit further along as well. I finished my PhD in 2008 at Indiana University, and now I'm at Griffith University in Australia, um, and I'm a senior lecturer here, and I've been working in university settings ever since I finished my PhD, so I think that's like eight years now, which <laughs> seems like longer than it should be. <laughs> yeah. But I'm obviously American um, and have moved to Australia, and I've been here almost two years. And I also worked in New Zealand um, at a university before this. Okay, great. So we'll get started. And question number one, um, what tips do you have for students to improve their teaching um, and preparing them for being a professor in terms of the teaching? Um, okay, I'll start. I don't know, when I was at Indiana, we had to do coursework with our PhD, and there were some courses offered outside of our department that focused on pedagogy, and so I took a few of those courses, which I thought were really helpful because they actually taught us how to teach, so if there's an opportunity to take those types of courses, I really recommend it, but I think another thing is utilizing um, like the teaching and learning office that almost every university will have something like that and they can provide resources and they hold a lot of times like seminars or um, workshops that can be really beneficial to helping um, understand your teaching and if you are a doctoral student currently teaching um, a lot of times they have the opportunity to come in and observe and provide um, written feedback and give you some tips so I think anything like that would be helpful. I would agree. Um, when I was actually at the, in, I also worked in Australia um, abroad as well. And when I was there, 
one of the things that they required us to do was a certification on teaching. So um, I thought that that it's similar to what you would do if you take additional courses like Andrea suggested, but um, it was a really nice opportunity to learn some things that I perhaps hadn't um, picked up along the way. Um, and so any opportunities that you can do seminars or certifications if your universities offer those, um, they're really helpful to, to learn some new tricks, I guess, of your trade. Yeah, so similar, uh, we did have to take a class in that, and I say have to, but really I wish I could have taken a lot more. Um, as I come in, you know, as a new faculty, you really, you know, any little tips in the classroom, because you're an expert in your content area, but not at all an expert in actual pedagogy, so any opportunities that you have to pursue that while you're still in school, I would definitely recommend. Um, when I first got here as well, um, I had some of my colleagues come in and observe me, and that was really helpful right from the start to just anything from where I was positioned in the classroom to how I was asking questions and things like that. So starting fresh without developing too many bad habits in the way that I'm presenting information. Um, so really just like um, being vulnerable and letting people give you that advice and come in and um, it was, it's was it been really helpful for me and I continue to seek out. We also have a center for teaching and learning so similar to that idea and just, I mean, they're a great resource. So. Um, you know, just being open to any and all advice early has been helpful. Great. And going off of that, uh, you usually end up with a larger teaching load as a professor than, than as a graduate student, depending on what type of job you get your first sort of go around. Uh, any tips in that particular area in terms of the balance? <laughs> That's a funny, that's funny, balance. Um, uh, I think that if you have a good university that can work with you so you don't have as many preps, so even if you have a higher teaching load, if they will are willing to give you the same classes or at least let you have less preps each semester, that can really help. And that can be part of your negotiation process. You can ask if, you know, for at least for the few first few years, you maybe teach the uh, the same types of courses so you're not prepping constantly. Um, that can help reduce your load some. Um, it's really easy to um, put teaching, like all of your grading and teaching first and then all of your research stuff on the back burner. So it's really important that you carve out grading time, re research time, writing time right away in your week so that, um, and you don't, don't budge from those if you can help it. Um, otherwise, it just things start to slip away from you really quickly. So um, I found that if I just tag time in my calendar, those are off limits, and I'm not going to grade during that time. I'm only going to write on that time or vice versa, and that really helps me stay more balanced throughout the week. Um, I'll just follow up to that. So this semester, actually, I've had a course release in order to help me develop my research line, and so I've been participating in these writing challenges, and that's been a helpful philosophy similar to that idea where you actually block off time and even if it's just 30 minutes a day or an hour a day or whatever you can afford that semester, um, you're actually having to really structure your time in that way because otherwise course prep would be what I do all the time, <laughs> like anything, you know, like every day just prepping for the next day. So um, small gains are better than none. And so this idea of just like, um, you know, being diligent about your time, I mean, even more, you think that you can't get busier than when you're doing your PhD, but that first year, especially when it's all new preps, um, just being really prepared of how you're going to structure your time. Yeah, I would agree with um, everything that Melissa and Bree said, and I think it can be so easy to get caught up in prepping for your courses, and like, you know, there's always something new that you can add, or there's always something that you can do differently to um, your lectures or what you're going to present and at some point you just have to draw the line and say this is going to be this is fine this is good um, and now I need to focus on these other tasks and I think really blocking out time for each type of task and, and maybe even it's just having like certain days of the week that you focus on different things um, but like Bree said you can't like try not to budge from that because things will always come your way where people need something or they want help with something or oh we want to invite you to do this with us and sometimes you just have to set those boundaries and um, make sure that you're still getting in the time to do other things that you need to do like your research. Great, thanks. And in terms of research, um, 
what tips you have in you know as a new researcher in terms of being also being a professor moving from that PhD research to something that will you know be successful as a as a professor you want to start this time <laughs> you want me to go? okay um, I can start um, I guess I'm still developing my research and you know like I said that's what my focus is this semester but um, developing those networks now and starting as much as you can as a grad student knowing that that first year is going to be a disaster for all that course prep so getting anything in the wheelhouse early um, takes a lot of pressure and stress off of that first year so that you have things that you've been working on that you can continue to work on throughout that time as opposed to starting fresh and trying to really develop a line once you're already there um, would be my recommendation but like I said because I'm new I'm still working this out myself um, this writing challenge has been helpful so just having another community to kind of there's like an accountability piece where we kind of check in every day um, so if you're a type of person that needs that finding that network whether it's somebody at a different university that checks in with you or somebody within your department um, just finding people to hold you accountable for whatever goals you might have and they can be small at the beginning but um, I'm, I'm really grateful that I did have some projects underway before I left grad school because like I said that first year is pretty chaotic so um, yeah that's my one piece of advice yeah, I was just thinking back to my first year out after the PhD and I was not very productive research wise and I had a really heavy teaching load, a lot of new preps, just things that and some topics that I didn't know so I was kind of saying one step ahead of the students. Um, so it was really difficult for me in the first year but kind of like Melissa said, I had connections and I had some projects in from when I was finishing my PhD and that was helpful. I think a big part of getting your research going and keeping it going is having um, collaborators that you know that you work well with. So for me it was other people that I had gone through the PhD process with and my PhD advisor and um, started, you know, started with that group and then I've sort of branched out and have new people that I collaborate with now but yeah I think just having some projects going um, will keep you on task with it because otherwise it's so easy to just say oh I really want to do this project but I'll wait until this is done I'll wait until this is done and then you never get around to doing it yeah I would agree um, those people that you collaborate with are, are really key to um, keeping you going and also they help you break up the work because obviously you aren't doing everything yeah. um, so you know you can start a, start a process of something send it off to your coworkers and then they can and they do their part and then it comes back to you in a different format so um, it does help keep the program moving along for you so that you don't get stuck um, I think the the stuff that I'm doing by myself is what's ended up getting shelved and so that is like why it's so important to work with other colleagues because the stuff that you know you do on your own you kind of do put off because all of the other deadlines that you're working on with other people become more of a priority for you so um, yeah I would say that um, networks and collaborators help a lot and if you can get tied in with key people and go to conferences and meet new people that you can work with um, that will keep your agenda moving forward for sure. Um, I actually have a follow-up to both of you I guess as you're more experienced but um, because I've been kind of reflecting on my circle right now and I have a lot of these fresh out of PhD friends and people that I'm working with but um, to what extent do you think that new grads should be pursuing advice from like like older faculty or from people our age like or people are you know year does that matter uh, I think oh go ahead yeah go ahead Bri. no you go ahead uh, I was when I first started I would say I was I was more um, connected to people of my own age or my own graduation time period but um, as I've moved along I guess I've gotten more secure in my own work and my own ability and that has allowed me to you know reach out to people who are perhaps are more senior to me um, and so I guess you know part of that's going to conferences and having conversations with people and and really coming up with some good ideas that you both that you all share or whatever so 
that has also given me confidence to reach out to people who might be a little bit farther along than even I am, or even you know experts in the field already. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I was gonna say um, kind of a similar thing where I probably started working more with people that I had done my PhD with, but I think going to conferences is really important if you're able to do it and you know you've got the funds or, or a little bit of support to do it because that's where like I met Bree at the NASM conference in Tampa and you know we became pretty close friends just based on meeting each other at that one conference and have stayed in touch and like she had already worked in Australia when I was interviewing for a job here so I was able to reach out to her to ask you know kind of what to expect what's different here so I'm getting off the research topic but I think the conferences are where you'll make a lot of contacts and people that you'll end up collaborating with or you'll develop those relationships and see oh this person's research is really similar to mine and it's easier if you're right there in person to have a conversation and kind of develop that relationship than to send an email and almost kind of like cold call somebody um, and I think I've been kind of lucky in that there have been a few people senior to me who have reached out to me and said, hey, we should work on something together. I've got this idea. And so it's just really developing these connections can help. Yeah, definitely. I'm sorry. Oh, I was just going to say, I think you also learn from the more experienced researchers, so it is good to work with them if you have those opportunities because you'll, you'll learn so much more um, about just the way that they do research, the way that they write, the review process, all of those things. I think we lost Melissa. I think we did. Oh, yes, we did. Uh, oh, the internet. Um, <laughs> okay, so so as I'll I'll reach out to her and and figure that out. Um, it, you know, as the as the two of you have been able to reflect, um, you know, these past few years, year few years out, um, that what do you feel like you would have done differently, or what do you think? surprise you in terms of the things you did as a PhD student or as a master's student that was really beneficial or realizing later wait I wish I had done X whatever it is um, well for me I think um, because I chose to go abroad and then then move back in the time period in which I did those two things um, I think I set myself back for tenure in the tenure process because you know it, every time you make a move your clock basically restarts and so um, that I don't think that I would have changed what I've done actually because the amount of experience that I have and how it enriched my life personally and professionally um, I don't think I mind but if your goal is to be tenured by a certain time, then switching universities is not the way to go because it will set you back a little bit. But if you're more interested in the experiences that you can get, learning from by being in different environments, traveling the world, or at least traveling to other parts of the U.S., um, you know that those are other things that you gain for being a little bit behind your peers in the t tenure process. Um, and she's back. I, I, sorry, my internet cut out, but I'm back. <laughs> um, Natalie, when you asked the question, it cut out a little bit on my screen, and I didn't actually hear what you asked. So I heard Bree's answer, but could you maybe say it again? Sure, and and this is useful because we can we yeah. bring it. Um, so the question it. I don't want to say, do you have any regrets from your PhD or the things you would have done differently, but do you have any regrets and are there any things you would have done differently? Or are there, are there things from your PhD that, or your master's that you realize, oh, that turned out to be a really good decision that I didn't expect it to be in terms of what you're doing now? Um, I think, I don't know that I have any regrets. And, Kind of like Bree said, I moved around quite a bit. Like I started, I had my first job at St. Mary's College of California. I was there a year. I went back to Indiana and worked there and in Bloomington and Indianapolis for, I think that was three and a half years. Then I went to New Zealand. I was at a university there for a year and a half. Now I'm in Australia. I've been here almost two years. So I've moved around quite a bit. And um, so, yeah, I think 
for me, the, the whole tenure thing wasn't, it wasn't like I really wanted to go to one place and stay there and get tenure there, and, and I've kind of, but I, for me, that's okay. Um, but yeah, I think if you're more focused on that, then doing what Bree said is important. And like the Australian system is completely different, so we don't really have tenure here. Like I'm a senior lecturer, which in the United States would be equivalent to associate professor. And so I have a three-year probationary period, and if I pass all of my reviews and do well at the end of that time, then I'm what they call confirmed. And that's kind of like tenure, but not, not nearly the same process that you go through for tenure. So... Um, yeah, but I don't really think I have any regrets or things I would have done differently. I, I felt like I got teaching experience in my PhD. I got um, research experience, obviously. The courses I took were beneficial, so I'm okay with how it turned out. And now that you've joined us, Melissa, any anything to add to that? Um, I was trying to think about this question too, and I don't necessarily have regrets either. Uh, because I feel like I did as much as I could in the time that I had, you know. Um, I, of course, would like to be more of an expert in stats, for example, or, you know, have um, have had more research published before I was applying for certain jobs. But at the same time, like I said, I really feel like I was doing the best that I could. And um, I think going out to conferences is, like, was one of the better experiences in my PhD because, you know, you get in your little bubble and that's great that you have, like, um, constructive classmates and whatnot, but I really, that's where I found, like, more of my people and it really encouraged me to say, yeah, this is what I want to do and this is where I want to be. Um, so, like I said, it's hard to, like, like Andrew said as well, it's hard to look back with regrets, but rather just kind of, you know, appreciate that this is where you are now. <laughs> You came out the other end, yeah. And I think, too, like, when you don't do things the way, you know, that you're supposed to, if that's even a thing, um, I feel like you just gain so much. Like, yeah, there's one path, and you can get into your first university, and you can get on that path to tenure, and that's yeah. one way to go. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. And then there's the other options where you, you know, explore your career in, in a different way. And... Um, you know, ultimately, you just need to decide what you want out of your career and what that means to you. And for Andrea and I, it was the exploration. Yeah. Um, I think it's probably too early for Melissa at this point, maybe, to yeah. say. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's it really was about learning about new things in different universities and how different countries do things. And I think that enriched us in very different ways. So it's just up to you and what you want to get out of your career and how you might then plan for that but the, I agree there's no regrets like I'm a big fan of not necessarily failure but you know not doing everything perfectly because oh, you learn yes. so much more from that so um, you know not always doing it the right way can always be very it can be a great experience too great thanks um, so I wanted to go to this question and you know competition for these positions in sport management as different different universities grow or start PhD programs, um, what trends do you see are happening in the hiring of sport management faculty? You know, it, it's been a while since I've been in the U.S. thing I see that I think is, is happening is because there are it's, it's getting more competitive. The number of tenure track positions seem to be going down. You see a lot more ads for um, lecturers or for instructors or the kind of um, non-tenure track positions. So I think teaching is really, really important and being a good teacher. Because in the past, you could get by on kind of mediocre teaching, and I think that's something that is a huge focus now for universities because that's how they can attract students. Um, and keep students at those universities if the, if the teaching is good. I also think even to just, many times just to get an interview, you've got to show a track record of publication. Um, whereas when I was going through and finishing eight years ago, it was, I don't think it was quite as important to have the publications then. And like if you had one, that was great. And now you're seeing people come out that have, you know, three or four. So I, I think the teaching and research are both really important. 
I think a big trend um, at the University of Delaware specifically and also um, I've noticed in other schools in the area um, that they're moving towards a continuing track line which they're now it's it's basically two distinct pathways so tenure track and continuing track and continuing track um, after a certain period of time you you get security so at Delaware what they do is a two-year review and then a four-year review and then um, a six-year review and then after your six-year review you have until your 13th year your 13th year so you get time added on to your contract um, so you do get some security um, but the differences in those two positions are, is what exactly what Andrew just said teaching versus research so if you're in a tenure track line you're expected to do high or excellence excellent research and if you're in a teaching line like the continuing tract is then you're expected to be an excellent teacher um, and so the the continuing track lines do pay less and so we do see more of them popping up because those those positions aren't as expensive for the university so it's unfortunate that we see a decline in tenure track positions with the rise of continuing track but um, that's kind of the trend I'm seeing it, at least at our university for sure and some of the others in this area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't have much to add, just that um, I was saying earlier that I went on and looked at the job postings just um, in prep for this because I hadn't been on for a little bit and I mean it could just be the wave of being in the spring but a lot of them I would echo this idea that there's a lot of opportunity for limited contracts but not necessarily tenure track and so I don't know, yeah, what that means for the future of sport management positions or if it's just the higher ed, you know, um, trends. But, um, and then I would also echo Andrea's, the idea of, like, being prepared in your interview to talk about your teaching strategies and whatnot um, because it is valued. It's, it, I mean, yes, research is going to be important as, as getting you in the door probably with your CV, but also being able to attest to how you're going to teach because they're going to rely on you for probably... Um, more teaching than you're expecting, even if you're a researcher. So, yeah, really important. Oh, thank you um, for your for your insight. And uh, so, for you viewers out there, I have a couple questions from people who've kind of sent it through through social media. Um, but viewers, you should be able to post questions. Um, there is a, a Q and A button, um, and you. So feel free to post those questions, and we will get to them um, as you know as they come up. So a question that that somebody asked through Twitter was, um, "What's what is the biggest thing you've learned from teaching slash in the classroom that you used moving forward?" <laughs> Might need a few minutes to, or a few seconds to think. I can jump in just with what I was talking about a little bit earlier when I had somebody come and observe me. So um, she came in and basically sat there the entire class and just started drawing like this sketch. And by the end of the class, there was this huge red, uh, black mark like right in the front. And what she was doing was, you know, following the path of where I was walking in the classroom to try to see like how I was how that was impacting the discussion in class. And what it was was, yeah, I was walking a lot at the front of the class back and forth, but not going down the rows or whatever. And so what that was doing is, you know, if there's one talker near the front, it's it's saying to all the people in the back of the room, like, I don't need to talk because that front person is. So um, I've changed, and now I walk up and down all around the classroom, and it really keeps everyone on their toes, and it's actually, you know, enabled better discussions because that was one of my biggest things, my struggles um, was just asking the right questions and getting everyone to participate in discussions and I that was a tip that really helped me was you know um, being more engaged around the classroom not just from the front outwards um, so that's just, I mean that's just a small tip but it really had a big impact on um, the the atmosphere in the class I would I would say that for me um, uh, I also move around a lot. I'm kind of like a ping ball, ping ping pong ball all, all around class. Um, and so getting a clicker is key. <laughs> so that you, and I test it usually if I can, you know, be wherever I am in the classroom and still advance my slides. But one of the things that I um, changed up was um, I make my. Oh well, we all try to make our students read, but they don't. 
Um, and so I started doing quizzes in class that are um, one one way that I could get writing more writing into the classroom was I do two short essay questions based on the reading. And one is somewhat simple that they could probably BS their way through it um, if they didn't read the chapter. But the second one, they cannot. Like, there's just no way they can do it. And so that's got them to read. And so I've changed up my entire lecture now. And so instead of putting anything on the slide that I would have related to the chapter, everything I put up on the board are questions. Nice. So um, I might put, maybe I'll put a definition of, of, or something that, like a key idea, but then all I put up are questions. And so the kids aren't writing, their heads aren't down, they're not glancing up and down and up and down, which drove me nuts. Um, they're engaged with me, and um, that's one of the things that I've completely changed from when I first started, when I just would stand up there and talk yeah. at them. Um, mm -hmm. and so that really changed the dynamic of my classrooms. Um, and at first they're a little slow, they, you know, it doesn't, they don't talk as much, but again, walking around the class and, and kind of trying to be more personable to them, I think that's helped. Um, one thing that I do, that I started doing when I was um, in my PhD because I used to teach my own courses when I did that and learning all of the students' names. I know it, it can be difficult, but like I've had classes of 80 where I know every single name and I think for one thing, it makes them feel like, oh my gosh, she knows who I am, so she knows if I'm not here. And so it seems to help with attendance. And then in class as well, they know that I know their name and I can call on them and say, oh, can you help answer this? And so they, I feel like they're more prepared if we have a discussion, like, oh, I might have to talk. I really should think about what I would say if she calls on me. Um, so I think learning their names can be huge. I used to do a thing, I don't do it anymore mostly because it was really time intensive, but I had, as part of the course, I think it was like five points or ten points out of their grade, um, they had to come into my office during office hours at some point during like the first three weeks of class and have a five minute conversation with me and that way I knew something about them and you know, could kind of draw on that if I needed to, but again, it sort of created this sense of she knows who I am, she knows something about me, but also they know me a little bit as a person too. Um, so if you have time to do something like that, I think it helps, if not just learning names and trying to get some little bit of information about each student, um, that can be helpful in terms of attendance and engagement and discussion. One of the tricks Great. that I use to learn names, just if it helps you all, is I, had, I hand out index cards and I make them put their names on the first on the on the front of the index card, which they prop up the first couple of days of class, which I see. But we also do attendance on it, so they have to actually sign their name that they were there that day, and then they they give it back to me every day in class. And so I see their name and their face, and so um, the first couple of weeks I already I have their names down quite quickly because I see their names with their cards, and I have to hand them back to them the next day. And so it's a really nice trick that I've used to keep attendance, but also learn their names quickly. That's good. That's yeah, really useful. Thank you. Um, so we have another another question, um, also through Twitter. And uh, those of you who are philosophy people, I, you'll appreciate this. Um, how are you guys getting into more Socratic case-based teaching techniques? Mm. Or are you? Do you? <laughs> Who wants to start? Well, I teach ethics, and we I we actually talk about and use <laughs> Socrates as, his teaching. So um, I actually use the man in my class and his teaching. So that's one way, I suppose, that I um, include them or include him for sure in my classwork, so, um, but, um, I don't know, um, how, how else to perhaps answer that. For some of the classes, it just doesn't work. For a class like ethics, I think it's, it goes along quite easily, but a lot of my classes, um, they're so a lot of them are very hands-on so we do we have clients every semester we're working on actual real projects for that client and so they actually have real world work that they're working on so um, 
it doesn't always work for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do, like, I teach more marketing and finance, and um, so we did go and work at, like, the minor league hockey team here, for example, to do a marketing plan, and we're doing, like, um, like they have to actually go out and use tools, and um, so, like, it, yeah, it's more hands-on than it is um, theorized or, like, questioning, but I think it can work really well in those d deeper thinking, which it sounds bad for me to say about my own classes, but, um, but, so, yeah, I guess I'm not the best person to ask either because of the, the nature of my class. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like I'm kind of the same because I teach um, like communication, which is public relations, um, a little bit of, and I teach marketing, and so yeah, it is. It's more hands-on, and I'm. I think in those courses, I'm more focused on them learning skills that they can use when they go out and get a job. Um, so yeah, I don't think I teach anything that's really like like Brie teaches ethics, which is probably mm -hmm. the closest for this. I, I guess I guess in a way by posing the questions um, uh, on you know in my class versus having thing you know bulleted lists yeah. there that they're copying down I guess is one way that I do it and also when I grade um, I my feedback are mostly questions like why did you think this like why would you think that this would lead to this outcome um, so most of my feedback is inquiry versus actual feedback so um, and I do that on purpose to get them thinking about I mean I try to direct them where I want them to go but the way I ask my question um, but I certainly give feedback through inquiry so mm -hmm. I think that hopefully also gives them thinking more critically about what they're saying and how they're answering questions great yeah and how many how often do you utilize things just in terms of case-based I mean I, I know you talked about a lot of application um, and, and I know, for example, in the in business schools, that the case base tends to be a more common uh, technique. Do you see that in the departments that whether or not you're in a business focused um, department, or is that a common thing in sport management? Yeah, I I use a lot of casework. Um, for sure, if we don't have a real project that we're actually doing many casework on to do to finalize the project. Um, they have real world cases that they're working on. I teach law as well, so of course I use casework in that class all the time. Um, and so I definitely try to get them working together and then we come back as a group and we discuss what each of the smaller groups have you know, worked on or what solutions they've come up with. And I think that because they work together first and collaborate um, with each other and then they go to the larger classroom, we get some different ideas and we can share those ideas and talk about them fully. So yeah, I use it a lot. Mm -hmm. I'm actually. Yeah. Right, oh. Oh, go ahead. Uh, <laughs> I was just gonna say, right now in my finance class, I I presented like at the teaching and learning fair on this, but um, uh, this thing called econ fantasy, and it's actually a simulation where we actually are playing fantasy hockey this semester, and then the program allows the students to set ticket prices, merchandise, um, they negotiate broadcast rights, and all these things. So. It's like a semester-long simulation that allows them, but we get to relate it to the actual NHL back, so we're learning a lot. I can always tie it back to, you know, the NHL or different leagues and, you know, um, macro and microeconomics. And um, so it's a really fun way to bring finance to life, particularly uh, given that it's an 8 a.m. class. So um, <laughs> it's really helped the students apply, like, you know, bring it to life as opposed to just talking about it from the textbook. So really useful. Great. Um, in my sport information course I do I guess I probably use like many cases throughout the semester because um, the way the way courses are structured here it's a bit different than any place I ever was in the United States like where I would have a course and in the US I would teach it you know two days a week for an hour and a half each day or I would teach it three days a week for like an hour each day and here we have um, it's divided into lectures and either they call it tutorials or seminars or workshops and so I teach typically a two-hour lecture for a course once a week and then I'll have a one-hour workshop with the students so those will be smaller groups where um, I'll have like multiple workshops and so in the sport information course I do the workshops for two hours in a computer lab and so they're learning a lot of 
like PR um, skills, they're learning a lot about how to use technology um, for communication. But we do like little mini cases. Probably, I don't know if we do it every single time, but a lot of times I'll give them little mini cases that focus on you know a problem or an issue, and they'll do what Bree kind of described and work in small groups on that, and then we'll talk about it as a larger class, and then that usually relates to something larger that they're going to do for an assignment or something like that. Great, that's really useful. Um, so to, to finish this off, because I know all three of you are very busy, um, and some of you are in different time zones, very <laughs> different. Um, I have a question from another, another PhD student. Uh, and asking, you know, you, you all three of you said you have no regrets about your PhD experience, um, but, you know, it, let's say advice for other PhD students. What, what would you see them potentially needing to do differently um, than what either you did or what you see commonly PhD students doing? Not to like say this is what um, I don't want to put anything on your spot on the spot. Just one thing that worked for me really well was moving from the time when I was doing my coursework into the time that I was working on my dissertation. I was also teaching um, because I had a teaching assistantship at IU, and so it was sometimes difficult to balance the when do I work on my dissertation versus how much time do I focus on this course that I'm teaching. And so I just had to set aside, I think I set aside like Tuesdays and Thursdays were dissertation days, and I, I rented out like one of those little cubbies in the library where I was up on the seventh floor and, you know, couldn't really be in contact with people and just would kind of hide away and spend all day there working on my dissertation and so I think that that's one thing just being able to set um, set your schedule and stick to it um, and, and just setting goals and kind of milestones and like I want to be here but by this date and you know really sort of forcing yourself to stick to that um, trying to think anything else that I've seen other people do I think when I was doing my PhD there were some other students who took jobs um, ABD so they were working in full-time faculty positions while they were still working on their dissertation. And for some, of, for some people, that works, and they're able to finish, and they're able to have that, um, that kind of self-control to do both things. And I thought for myself that would be too much, and I wasn't confident I would finish the dissertation when I wanted to. So I think being realistic with yourself if you are you know, considering doing that, just be really realistic with is it – worth it to get the full-time job maybe a semester earlier or a year earlier, but then maybe your PhD suffers as a result. So kind of just figuring out if, if that's something you can do or not. Yeah. Do, do either of you have uh, additional insight that you want to add or, or we can wrap up? Please, no. No, good. I was just going to, like, I don't have really anything new. The only thing I said, like, as I uh, mentioned earlier with the research, is really push yourself to get as much going before you leave because you're in that mindset for research. And so, I mean, yes, you have this big dissertation, but you're also, because you're in that mindset, it's kind of easier to just, to just get more going so that it's started so that you don't have so much pressure. Like, you can focus more on teaching for that first year. Um, that would be, retrospectively, I would recommend you all get on that. <laughs> yeah, I would say the same thing. Um, you know, both both of you gave great advice for that. I would also say that, um, again, finding a, a structure that works for yourself because it's so easy to put things on the black back burner. It's, I mean, once meetings pile up, once you're doing committee work, once you're um, you know, all your service, which is the least amount of your your workload, ends up being quite a bit of your time. You know, and you, if you let that start to slip, then it's really going to impact your writing. Um, and so, you, I, can, I cannot stress it enough to to carve out that time in your day where you sit down, even like as Melissa said, even if it's thirty day, thirty minutes. That's it. I mean, at least you can write for a solid thirty minutes, and if that's all you can give it, then that's fine. But um, you definitely don't want to put it off because that's the easiest thing to let go because it's really the hardest for us to do because it takes a lot of our brain power. So, you know, the easy mundane things are, are you know, you just want to get them off your plate, but that's the stuff that you, you should let slide. 
keep your writing going because you can always do the mundane things later. So um, that's what I would recommend. Great. Can I like, jump in and say one more thing really quickly? Go for we it. Just, we brought up the, the concept of service, which we haven't talked about yet, and I think I want, I want anyone who's getting ready to go into a career in academia to understand that service is... It, like Bree said, it will take up, it can, it has the ability to take up so much of your time. And so, and when you're new and you're a new faculty member and you're just starting out, you want to say yes to everything and you really have to understand what is my, what am I expected to do service wise and what can I do to meet that expectation? But don't let service take up so much of your time because, yeah, it's, it, it has the ability to, and you'll be asked to do a lot of things and serve on a lot of committees and do different things, and you really have to pick and choose and try to find the service things, the service roles that you can be passionate about, because sometimes you'll get a service role and it's just like, oh, I don't want to do this, and then you find that you don't actually do a very good job at it, um, whereas other things, like with the NASA and the Publicity and Promotions Committee that the, the, the three of us are on, like that's my most fun service commitment ever because I like doing it, so it doesn't feel like work. Um, so try to find those opportunities if you can. Great. That's a, that's a great way to finish us off. Um, <laughs> to talk about that We've talked about teaching, talked about research, and now finish off with a little service discussion. Thank you so much to the three of you, um, and for everybody watching, if you have friends you couldn't join us, that it will be available um, on YouTube. So thank you again, and everyone have a good night. Thanks for having me.